uh, in a few minutes, in a few minutes, you will hear from Alan Siegel, who will introduce all of us to stand with us. I want to begin um, by thanking the sponsors for this morning's program. Kathy Winterfield is one of our sponsors in memory of her beloved husband, Peter. And Alan Siegel has also chosen to serve as a sponsor. So we are most grateful to both of them. We're also grateful to all of those who have participated in creating today's program. And as you well know, it takes a village to make anything happen. So to each and every one of you, a very special thank you. I wanted to begin by sharing with you an experience I had this past week. For me, Hadassah is the primary link between America and Israel. And this week, together with some friends, we spent the morning at the Jacksonville Veterans Memorial Wall. While there, we met a veteran who told us about his experiences in the military. He fought in Vietnam, which was a difficult time for him, came back and while he was very grateful to the army for having taught him how to be a mechanic and he was able to secure a job as a mechanic, he realized that his life was still very directionless. And so after a period of time, he re-enlisted in the army and had a, a purposeful career for over 30 years. Well, as you may or may not know, in June, Hadassah was very proud to participate in the graduation of a hundred of our youth Aliyah children who have spent much of their growing up years in Mea Shafaya, one of the three Hadassah villages. One of the parents had this to say about the teachers and her daughter's experience there. You are wonderful teachers, and thanks to you, our children have discovered new paths to success. They have created new dreams, they have learned to believe in themselves and to strive for themselves and for others. Thank you for your tireless interest in the well being of our children. And that was just echoes for me of what I had heard from the veteran. <clears throat> um, we all have the opportunity to support um, our children in Israel. And while Hadassah is well known for its commitment to health um, and our two hospitals, we should never forget that we are the parents to many children who for whatever reason are unsafe and unable to live with their biological parents. With that, I'd like to turn the program over to Alan so that Alan can introduce us to stand with us. Take it, Alan. <laughs> Thank you, Goldie. My name is Alan Siegel, and I, along with Isabel Ballatin, uh, share the job of community coordinator for Northeast Florida Stand With Us uh, chapter of um, Stand With Us Southeast Region. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with Stand With Us, Stand With Us is an international and nonpartisan Israel education organization that inspires and educates people of all ages and backgrounds challenges misinformation and fights anti-Semitism. Stand With Us empowers and energizes students and communities with leadership training and educational uh, programs on hundreds of college campuses, high schools, and middle schools. Stand With Us informs through social media, print and digital materials, films, weekly newsletters, and missions to Israel. Founded in 2001 and headquartered in Los Angeles, the organization has programs on five continents with chapters and offices throughout the US, in Israel, the US, I'm sorry, in Israel, the UK, Canada, and Brazil. Stand With Us has received the highest ratings from Charity Navigator, four stars, and GuideStar, platinum level, 
and is a U.S. registered 501c3 nonprofit and Section 46 charity for Israel. Stand with us is not politically aligned in any country. It does not and has never advocated specific policies for Israel. Our work and our respect for Israel's democratically elected government are not contingent on which parties are in power. Our goal is to counter anti-Semitism and to educate the public about Israel and empower others to educate their communities and to make it possible to have reasonable, informed conversations about Israel's policies on campuses and in communities. Our speaker today is Charlotte Torchak. Charlotte is the edu Senior Educator and Director of International Student Programs that stand with us, Israel, where she educates and trains students from around the world in Israel history and activism. Charlotte grew up in both the United States and Israel, spending her formative years living in Jerusalem during the Second Intifada, giving her both an internal and external perspective on Israel and the conflict. She graduated with a BA in Middle Eastern History from the University of Southern California, where she also took part with the Stand With Us Emerson Fellowship. Charlotte has been since been working for uh, Stand With Us, having initially served as the West Coast Campus Coordinator based in Los Angeles. She then immigrated back to Israel, transferring to the Stand With Us Israel office. In her current role as senior educator, Charlotte works with over 15,000 students a year from nearly every continent, educating them about Israel and training them to be effective activists in their high schools, universities, and communities worldwide. She has quickly become one of the foremost public speakers in our field. It is my pleasure this morning to introduce to you Charlotte Korczak. Thank you so much, Alan. Thank you. That was an amazing introduction to stand with us. So I'm glad that I don't need to touch on that now. Um, I just, I'm so happy to be here and I'm just so happy for all of you to join me on this amazing Sunday morning. So um, before we dive in, I just want to introduce myself just a little bit more. So you get a feel for really who I am and where I'm coming from and why I'm doing this work. I, as you heard, I was originally born and raised in Los Angeles. I lived in LA until I was nine years old. But when I turned nine, about nine and a half years old, my family decided to uproot me and my four older siblings and move us to Israel. And we lived in Israel for five years. And like you heard in my bio, three years into our journey in Israel, the second intifada started. And this was really my introduction to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I was not familiar with this conflict. I never you know, learned about it in a classroom or read about it in a book. And all of a sudden I was living it. My... My, my life became a life of terror, and I'm not trying to sound dramatic, but I lived in Jerusalem. This city suffered over 600 terrorist attacks. I'm sure all of you remember that time period. Uh, the bus, bus that I took to school was blown up. I missed that suicide bombing by about 10 minutes. My entire family thought that I had perished, whereas 15 other people in my community were killed that day. I unfortunately, as a 14-year-old, lost three friends in one suicide bombing, mm -hmm. and so this conflict was just real and raw for me. It wasn't, again, something that was scholarly or academic or let's dive into the history. It was just, I lived this and I know that people are suffering. At least I knew people were suffering on Israel's side. And so I had a very skewed understanding of this conflict. And then my family moved back to the States. We moved from Jerusalem to Las Vegas, which is like very weird, the holy city to the city of sin. And I found myself in a very different world all of a sudden. I found myself at like an inner city high school. So terror of another kind, just making sure that I get home every day with my bones intact. Um, and and a, a world where people didn't understand what was going on, but also a world where I didn't face anti-Semitism really that much or anti-Zionism. And I was uninformed. And so I, I ended up leaving uh, Vegas and moving to Maryland, like I mentioned when we were schmoozing in the beginning. And again, I, I moved into a, a nice little Jewish bubble in Potomac, Maryland, where I, again, wasn't really exposed to anti-Semitism or anti-Zionism. My identity was never really challenged. And then I went back out to Los Angeles. I got into the University of Southern California. And so there I was at a very apathetic school, at a school that is mostly conservative in kind of a bastion of liberalism that is Southern California. And I, again, for much for the early part of my of my schooling, I didn't face this stuff. But six months into my freshman year, I found myself coming face to face with an apartheid wall. 
And I didn't know what that was. Again, I had never been exposed to anti-Zionism. So here I'm looking at this wall and on it is spray painted horrible things that, you know, Zionism is racism. So in that moment I became a racist and I didn't know why. And that, you know, Israel was committing a genocide and, you know, ethnic cleansing and every claim that we've heard in the book. And I found myself in a position that I think many young people today find themselves in, young Zionists, young Jews, which is being attacked and really not knowing how to respond. Just, you kind of know that it's not true, but you just don't know the facts well enough or the definitions or the concepts that we need to know to be able to defend ourselves. But also more importantly, I think, yes, maybe in that moment I needed to protect and de defend Israel, but for much of my college career and much of my life since then, it's not about defending. It's not about trying to take somebody who's hateful and try to make them not hateful. It's really about education. So many people out there, how they feel about Israel is not rooted in hate, in hatred or in malice. It's rooted in just ignorance or apathy. And so what we do as an organization and what I love so much is that I don't feel like an advocate. I'm an educator. It's about giving people real information and making it compelling and making them want to listen to this story. And if they don't want to listen, show them that they don't know and get them to a point where they say, you know what, I don't know. And just like I don't know about a lot of conflicts in this world, I'm just not going to have an opinion. I'm not going to comment on it which is half the time all I'm asking for because I don't have a lot of opinions on a lot of things going on in this world because I just don't know about them. And that's okay, right? Don't chime in because you chiming in from a place of ignorance can actually cause real harm in real time in real life. You know, kids think, oh, I'm going to post something on Instagram or I'm going to post something on TikTok and like, what's the big deal? And then Jews are being beaten in the streets. So that's the big deal, right? So where we come at it is from an educational place. How can I give people the real facts, but again, in a compelling way that makes them want to hear the story? And I hope you hear it in my voice. Half the battle is speaking with passion. Half the battle is speaking from a place of, I care so much about this because this is my people. This is about our survival and our ability to live in this world as a minority that is protected and that feels security wherever we are. And that is not something the Jews have ever really been able to enjoy. And that is a story that must be told for people to understand Zionism. So let's dive in. Let's dive into this topic. You know, it's my, this is my favorite presentation because it really, to me, encapsulates so much of what we have to deal with. And yes, it is somewhat from a negative because concepts and misconceptions, it's a lot about tackling the misconceptions out there and the misconceptions that get people to this conclusion that Israel shouldn't exist, which already off the bat, we should say like, what? Like how, what? Like when people say that to me, I tend to be like, just out of curiosity, what other countries are on that list of yours? You know, is it just Israel or are there other countries also that you're looking to get rid of in this world? Because it's just, it's the most ridiculous, illegitimate criticism out there. Oh, you're bad. You shouldn't exist anymore. I mean, are we surprised though? We're Jews. That's not something that we haven't heard before, right? So I want to dive in and I'm going to take this, the way that we're going to structure this is really to honing in on those core misconceptions, those core claims, and through them learning the real information and facts and concepts that we need to have down pat to be able to educate our friends, our peers, our children, our grandchildren on this topic. All right. By the way, you hear me, I can get really excited. If I start to go too quickly, please just put in the chat, slow down and I will slow down. Um, sometimes I don't notice that I'm doing it. I'm trying to maintain my, my, uh, my rhythm, but again, I get excited and then I forget. Okay, so the first and probably most important thing that we have to talk about is the false narrative. The false narrative that is so incredibly believable and has completely taken hold in this world. So what's the false narrative? The false narrative is that we Jews are white European colonialists who came to a foreign land, Palestine, and stole it from the native population. And usually they'll refer to the Palestinians as the indigenous population. Now, I tend to say to my students, we are at a real disadvantage, right? I mean, we are we are fighting against a narrative that is, again, so incredibly believable, right? Some white people from Europe went to a country with darker people and stole their land. Hmm, sound familiar? We're Americans. Hi. Like, this is so easy to accept. Meanwhile, the actual real story, right, which is 
this story of this indigenous people who ended up in exile for 2000 years and suffered persecution, then deciding to return home and reestablish their sovereignty is something that's never happened before in history. It's an anomaly historically. And so here I am trying to tell somebody, oh, you know that narrative that you've heard that's very common? That's actually not true, but here's this unique story that you need to believe. We're at a disadvantage. The only thing that gives us an advantage is the fact that that's the truth. And as long as we know that that's the truth, we can prove it, right? So let's go through them one at a time. Jews are white European colonialists. Okay, first of all, Jews are white. Now, I don't know about you, but I have a hard time looking at somebody saying, I'm not white. Hi. And I think most of us in this room would have that problem, right? Can't be like, what are you talking about? I'm not white. We have white skin, a lot of us. But as Jews, we also know something. We know that as a collective, us Jews would never identify as a white people. Why? Because we all know we might not be these people, but maybe some, I'm trying to look at the screen, but we know that over half of the Jewish population in the world today are Jews of color. They're people of color. And so the idea that we would ever characterize ourselves as white would be a rejection, an erasure of over 50% of our population, which is exactly what I say to people who call us white. I say with all due respect, I might have white skin, but there is over half of the population of Jews who don't. And why would you want to erase them? Right? Especially in this world, especially when somebody's liberal or progressive and they say this to me, right? And so that's number one. I'm not white. As a collective, we are a people with a diversity in terms of the color of our skin. Now, why? Well, let's go to the second point. I'm also not European. For many of us, we might have what we call diasporic European identities, right? We, our families ended up in Europe and we adopted identities like French or, or Austrian or Polish, but we were Polish Jews. And the Jewish part is really important because the Jewish part was really our identity. And the Jewish part links us back to our historic homeland, which is Judea, right? So we are the Jews from Judea. And so I'm not European. I have, again, a diasporic identity that is European, but my origins are Judea. I'm a Jew from Judea. The language that I grew up praying in and learning in was the language that was spoken only in one place, in Judea, not anywhere else in this world. Now, the next piece is really important and it ties into what we just spoke about. The next piece is accusing us of being colonialists, right? Now, what's the root of that? The root of that is trying to frame the Jews as foreign to the land of Israel. Oh, you're from Europe, right? Which is ironic because we all know that throughout our history in Europe, we were never accepted. And usually what they said to us was go back to Palestine. Well, we did. And now they're like, nah, go somewhere else. Now you're colonialists again. How? And so really when somebody says you're a colonialist, the response is, no, I'm not a colonialist. I myself was colonized, hence my white skin. Because 2000 years ago, my ancestors were dragged out of my homeland and sent to Europe. And 500 years before that, a whole nother chunk of the Jewish population was forced out of the land and sent into the Middle East, the rest of the Middle East, which is why we have Middle Eastern Jews and African Jews. And that's why Jews aren't white. Jews are a people who were colonized on multiple occasions, forced into exile, which created these many phenotypes that we have, that we have adopted or have, that we've grown into over the last 2,000, 2,500 years. And so I tend to look at people today when they say, oh, well, I'm just an anti-colonialist and that's why I'm an anti-Zionist. And I say, well, that's strange because I'm also an anti-colonialist and I am a Zionist because I'm an anti-colonialist. Because what Zionism was, wasn't a colonization of a foreign land. It was a decolonization of land that the Jews are indigenous to. And that's where we really have to bring all this together. The foundation upon which we must have these conversations is first and foremost, the person understanding that we, the Jews, again, are not white, are not European, are not colonialists, but that we are indigenous to the land of Israel. That again, the language that we spoke and that today we speak in Israel is the language that started there when we became a people. That our culture, that our traditions, our yearly calendar that Jews still follow throughout the world all ties back to that land. That Jews have lived there continuously since we became a people 3,000 years ago in that land, and that we're intrinsically connected to it. There are literally traditions we cannot practice if we're not in our land. It's this year, right? We're in a Shemitah year right now. 
And the only place where Shemitah is practiced is in the land of Israel. We tick every box of indigeneity. We're just this very weird indigenous people. Because unlike most indigenous groups, they're small. Most people don't know about them. Most people haven't heard their language. And usually they've stayed on their land their entire existence. We're this weird indigenous people who have spent 2000 years in exile living all over the world. And that's hard for people to understand. So it's up to us to explain it to them as Jews who practice these traditions and, and follow this culture. And we'll get to that in the end. We'll tie it all together. So that's the first part. I'm not white, I'm not European, I'm not colonialist. I am indigenous to the land of Israel. I am Judean at my core. And Zionism was a decolonization, not a colonization. Now let's jump to today. Because the second part of that story is that we came to this land and we stole it from the native population. Now, Palestinians aren't indigenous to the land. And I'm not saying that to be offensive. I'm saying it because it's true. And I don't like to play fast and loose with truth. Their language is Arabic. Their culture is Arab Muslim culture predominantly. That all stems from the Arabian Peninsula. And they came and they conquered and colonized the land in the seventh century. And again, I'm not accusing modern day Palestinians of being colonialists because that's a ridiculous thing to do. But what we can acknowledge is Palestinians are native to the land the same way that I'm native to the United States, but I'm indigenous to the land of Israel, right? They've been born, they were born there. They've had generations. They've been there for over a thousand years. They have a legitimate claim to this land. They're not indigenous, that doesn't matter. But the notion that they're native and indigenous and we aren't, that's where we have a problem. So when we get to modern times, we then have to tell this very quick story about how Israel was founded. And I, I, I'll keep it brief because we don't have time and also because I'm sure most of you know this story, but there's core points that we need to be emphasizing. So one, why Zionism, right? What happened in the, in the 19th century that Jews woke up and said, you know what, let's go home. Now we didn't just wake up, right? We know that Zionism as a concept, what we would usually call ancient Zionism has been around since the first exile by the Babylonians. Right, where the Jews ended up in Babylon and we wrote the Psalms that said, you know, we, we sat and we wept on the banks of the Jordan, of, of, the, of, of the river, and we yearned to return home. That was Zionism in its purest form. We're in exile and we're not supposed to be in exile. We're supposed to be home. And what happened in the 19th century was a modernization of that idea. And what emerged was what we would today call modern political Zionism. Now let's define that term. Now, when it emerged, what it was, was a Jewish liberation movement. Right? It was a Jewish liberation movement seeking to free the Jews from persecution and achieve self-determination. And that's what it was back then because we achieved self-determination. So what is modern political Zionism or modern Zionism today? Let's define it with a very clear, concise definition that we can all use. Here we go. Zionism is the belief in and support for Jewish self-determination in their historic indigenous homeland. That's it. It's simple. It's concise. It's easy. Again, I'll say it, the belief in and support for Jewish self-determination, and I'll add a piece here, manifesting as statehood in their historic indigenous homeland. And those two components are very important, self-determination, statehood, and it has to be there. And why does it have to be there? We'll answer that by the end of this. What are the roots of Zionism? This is such a core concept that we have to know how to explain. And no, it wasn't, oh, let's go conquer the Arabs. The Arabs were not even part of the equation when we were developing this modern Zionist movement. What was, what was the impetus? Anti-Semitism. It was right there. The Europeans were asking themselves, oh, the Jewish question, what are we going to do with our Jews? And some of the Jews started to say, hmm, maybe we should answer this question because we're the ones suffering. And some Jews rose up and said, enough is enough. We've been dealing with this persecution in Europe for 1900 years and we're done. And this idea was emerging in the world. Nationalism, this notion of a national state and Jews said, ah, that's what we need. Because if we have a national state, then we can have an army. And we finally don't have to be at the mercy of the world, but we can protect ourselves. That's the roots of Zionism. Read Herzl, Read Der Judenstadt, the first few chapters of Der Judenstadt, all he talks about is anti-Semitism. The, the Herzlian, the Herzl who was an assimilationist two years before the Dreyfus affair and turned very quickly to become a Zionist. So what happened? Jews started to immigrate. 
They started to move to Israel, Palestine under the Ottoman Empire. And they bought land legally and they moved to that land. And yes, sometimes they found Arabs living on the land that they had purchased. And there sometimes were this, was this displacement that would occur. It wasn't illegal. It wasn't a stole, stealing of land. It wasn't an illegal theft. But for the Palestinians, for the Arabs who were living there, it felt like they were their land was being stolen. And here we have the real embryonic stages of the modern day Palestinian narrative that the Jews came in and stole our land. It's not what happened. And what we see developing in the early 20th century is now these competing nationalisms, Jewish nationalism versus Arab nationalism that will set their sights on the same land. Now the Arab nationalism was a much wider scope. It wasn't just the land of Israel, Palestine. It was much of the Middle East. But for the Jews, it was just this little sliver of land. And we'll compete. And as we know, come post-World War I, the Jews get a nice push because the British say, we're going to support this, right, in the Balfour Declaration. And then three years later, the League of Nations say, we're going to support this as well. And we're going to reaffirm the Balfour Declaration and the British mandate. And we Jews are like, yeah, Zionism is being supported, but there's a problem because there are still Arabs living there and they're the majority and they don't want to live in a Jewish country. And unfortunately, the way in which they choose to express this is through violence. And so in the 20s and in the 30s, the Jews suffer these violent attacks from these Arab militias led by the leader of the Muslim community, Haj Amin al-Husseini. And by 1937, something crazy happens. The British realize that they maybe have backed the wrong course. They wake up and realize there are a lot more Arabs and a lot less Jews. And Chamberlain is taking, is taking office. And let's be real, he's not exactly a fan of the Jews. And he, they realize maybe we should change the mandate. And here they, they offer the craziest deal. They look at the Jews and they say, look, we know we promise you 100%. And we even know that that promise is legally binding. Because it, it was a treaty between, it was a, an agreement between the League of Nations and the British, which means it was internationally legally binding. And we know that, so we know you have 100%, but are you okay with like only accepting 20%? And we're going to give 75% to the Arabs. And we, the British, are going to keep 5%. So 20% to the Jews, 75% to the Arabs, 5% to the British. That was called the Peel Commission. And here's the craziest part. We're being described as violent colonial conquerors. And those same violent colonial conquerors are the people who in 1937 said, okay, yeah, we have 100%, but we'll accept your measly offer of 20% just because we need a country and we need it now. Because it was 1937. And not many saw what was going to happen because it was impossible pr to predict what was about to happen. We couldn't, it was unfathomable. But Ben-Gurion said, We've already seen them strip Jews of their citizenship in Germany. They've boycotted their shops. They've destroyed their shops. Who knows what's coming next? We need a country and we need it now. Again, anti-Semitism. But the Arabs in 1937 collectively came together and said no. They outright rejected this. And they said, we are not going to accept a Jewish state in any borders. Arab rejectionism, an idea that will push this conflict along until they finally let go of it in 2002, the Palestinians have never let go of it. So the Peel Commission didn't happen and we have more violence. And then we all know what's gonna happen. The worst of the worst possible thing that could happen. And 10 years go by and 1947 rolls around and the world now can no longer deny the need for Zionism. And the UN draws up the UN partition plan, dividing the land now into 55% for the Jews and 45% for the Palestinian Arabs. And yet again, the Jews say yes. And yet again, the Arabs say no. But let's note something, because it's so incredibly important. That shift that occurs between 37 and 47. You know, in 37, it was still very easy, I think, for people who were not Jewish to look at Jewish Zionists and say, ah, why do you really need a country? I mean, like, we get it, you're persecuted, and like, there's a massacre here and a pogrom there, but like, what's the worst that's gonna happen? And then, of course, the worst possible thing that could happen happened. And the abandonment of the Jews was widespread. And so by 1947, nobody had the audacity to look at the Jews and say, why do you need a country? The idea of the Jews' need for their own protection, because all it took, 
I was watching a documentary and this so stuck with me. I've watched a lot of World War II documentaries, so I wish I could remember which one it was. But in it, when they were talking about World War II, they said, you know, it wasn't that everyone hated the Jews. It was just that nobody made the Jews their top priority. And that's all it took. All it took was us not being anybody's top priority for us to lose 6 million of our people. And so by 47, it was clear. And so the UN votes. And on November 29th, they say, we will support the establishment of a Jewish state according to the UN partition plan. The Arabs didn't wanna hear this. And let's be very clear about who started this war the next day on November 30th, 1947, because it was not the Arab world. It was Palestinian Arabs, Haj Amin al-Husseini's militias who go out into the streets and ambush Jewish buses returning from celebrating the partition plan. And that's how this war begins. And people try to put it on the larger Arab countries. No, 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 I'm sorry. I'm not gonna absolve all of the Palestinians. No, you started a war because you wanted 100% of the land because you were convinced that we were foreign colonialists and you gambled. That's what you did. You had a promise, a guarantee of 45% and you said, no, no, I want 100%. And what did you end up with? You ended up with nothing. And your people being victims of this war because many of them turn into refugees. Refugees who then become perpetual refugees because they keep them in that position. And then during that war, the Jews declare independence. And of course they get recognition. Because again, the world understood Zionism in that point. That's how our country came to be. Yes, I told it a little bit long because we gotta know those core facts. We gotta present people with the Peel Commission. We have to explain to people that the Jews were not, again, these violent, uncompromising colonialist conquerors, but were a people seeking freedom and, and really seeking freedom from persecution. And of course we'd be willing to compromise because we just wanted a place where we can live quietly. We still haven't gotten that, but that's how our country came to be. And so we have to retell the story. And again, we have to make it a compelling one because it is a compelling one. And we'll again, answer more questions as we go through this, but that's point number one, the false narrative corrected. We're not a colonizing conquering people. We are an indigenous people who returned home to reestablish our sovereignty so that we can finally protect ourselves from this constant endless persecution that we've suffered throughout our existence. The second claim jumps to Israel's existence. It becomes when Israel was created, Israel's committed atrocities from the war of independence or the Nakba as it would be referred to as with the ethnic cleansing of the Arabs to an attempted genocide over the last 70 years, to apartheid-like policies turning Israel into an apartheid state. These are the accusations that we face. Some of them, asinine. The notion that you can accuse the Israelis of genocide is the most ridiculous thing if you just look at the evidence. One, genocide is judged by stated intent. Where is their stated intent that we wanna wipe out all the Palestinians? Okay, maybe we're, we're smarter than Hitler and we didn't say it out loud, fine. Show me evidence to support that that's what's been happening. In 1948, there were 1.2 million Arabs living between the river and the sea. Today, there are 11 million Palestinians in the world. Where is their systematic killing? And you know, oftentimes they'll say, well, look at what's happened in Gaza in the last 10 years. Look, every so often there's that spike where you go in and you guys massacre people. And my response is always, really? Are we sure? How about we look at each one of those circumstances? 2008, 2009, Operation Cast Lead. Oh, right, it was an operation. An operation that was started with a bunch of rockets being launched into Israel and Israel responding. That's not a massacre. That's a war where, unfortunately, and let's all acknowledge, throughout conflict, innocent people die. And yes, Palestinians have died, but it's not been systematic and they haven't been targeted. It's been because there is a terrorist organization that's targeting Israel and Israel needs to respond. And that terrorist organization embeds themselves within those civilian populations. And we can go back to 2012, same exact thing. 2014, same exact thing. And of course now May of 2021. So no, genocide is ridiculous. And honestly, I usually tell people that it's just really offensive. How dare you? Like it's one of those moments where I kind of just put my hands up, how dare you? We know what genocide really looks like. This, this is the conflict. That's what it is. Let's not play fast and loose with very, very important terminology in this world. That's number one. Number two, ethnic cleansing. 
This is an accusation that's been going on since 1948 and has reemerged very aggressively when it comes to what's going on in Jerusalem, which is ridiculous every step of the way. First of all, 1948, the evidence that's used to support the notion of ethnic cleansing was an order put forward by David Ben-Gurion in late March of 1948. Now, what was happening at this time, because context is the most important thing to understand anything in this world, the context was that Jerusalem was under siege and the Jews in Jerusalem were being starved to death. Literally, they were eating grass by late March. And in May, we knew the British mandate was expiring and we knew the British were going to leave. And we were watching as the Arab countries were itching to get involved in this war. And so Ben-Gurion, decides to issue an order. It was called Plan Dalid, Plan D. And he said, we need to turn offensive and we need to go village to village and we need to clear out any hostility from within our territory, within the territory that's gonna become the future Jewish state. Because once these armies invade, we are going to have to fight against much bigger armies and we gotta build up that front line and we can't have hostility from within. People change this. And they say, oh no, he said to go village to village and to clear out the Arabs. No, he didn't. And how do we know that? Because for example, on the road to Jerusalem where this all started because we had to break the siege on Jerusalem, we went village to village. And yes, a lot of those villages were expelled because there were Arab militias in those villages being hostile, attacking that road, ensuring that the siege would hold. But then we come to a town Maybe many of you have driven through it. Maybe you've even sat and eaten hummus there. And if you haven't, you should. It's a wonderful town called Abu Ghosh. Abu Ghosh existed in 1948. It still exists in 2021. And it's a thriving, a thriving Arab city outside of Jerusalem. In fact, in May of 2021, when rockets were being launched at Jerusalem, one of them fell in the Arab town, on the outskirts of the Arab town of Abu Ghosh. And you notice in 1948, the Jews didn't touch Abu Ghosh. Why? Because they weren't hostile. It wasn't about expelling Arabs, it was about expelling hostility, which by the way, makes a lot of sense because at the time we were fighting for our survival. The message was no Jewish state. The message is we are gonna do everything in our power to prevent the emergence of a Jewish state. Do you think our concern was, oh, we're racist and we wanna make sure to get rid of all the Arabs? No, our concern was let's get rid of people who are hostile towards us so we can survive this war. And the key piece of evidence is that when the war ended, 160,000 Arabs who remained in the territory become citizens of the state of Israel. Where's the ethnic cleansing? And I, I mean, I, the most important, they got the right to vote in the first parliament created by David Ben Gurion in 1949. There was an Arab party in his coalition. Where's the racism? It was a war. And during war, people are displaced. Expulsions happen. And yes, sometimes atrocities happen. And in our war, atrocities happen as well. And no, I'm not trying to, I never try to hide that or push it aside. But again, that doesn't mean that we had this all, this, this idea that we had to get rid of all the Arabs. It was never part of the Zionist ideology. Read Herzl, read Ben Gurion, even read Jabotinsky. They always talked about the Arabs living amongst us freely and with equal rights. Something that we're still striving for, I would say, until today. It's there in the law, but we still have a lot of, a lot of work to do on the ground. But ethnic cleansing is crazy. And when we jump to Jerusalem today in modern times, I mean, yes, yes, let's acknowledge. There are some people who are extreme on a political side of the spectrum that would love to see all of the Arabs leave Jerusalem and it be a Jew-only city, but they are a minority and they are not controlling policy. And how do we know that? Because since 1967, when Israel took control over the Eastern part of Jerusalem, the Arab population has only grown. It started out as about 28% in, 1940, in 1967, today it's at 38%. Where is the ethnic cleansing? And now granted, I, I, Jerusalem is a whole big, I mean, it is a complicated, challenging, topic. But to chalk it up to ethnic cleansing is ridiculous. And it's really just a demonization of Israel. 
So we need to be able to push aside the demonization aspect of ethnic cleansing and genocide and get to a point where I can say, let's really talk about the issues in Jerusalem. Let's talk about these politics. Let's talk about what's really going on on the ground. But let's not, let's not build it up to something that it's not, where then we can't really address it and all we're seeing is a demonization of one side. It's not helpful. Yeah, see, Sophia knows they have the best restaurants in Abu Ghosh. I'm telling you, if you've never been, go and eat hummus there. All right. The next one is apartheid. Now, apartheid, I mean, most of us, I mean, we can roll our eyes. Apartheid is ridiculous. Israel's a democracy. It was born a democracy. From the day that it was founded, it said that we had equal rights for all of our citizens, no matter their race, their religion, or their gender. Now, again, people would say, yeah, yeah, but there's racism in Israel. Of course there's racism in Israel. We've been in a conflict for 100 years. Can you as an American explain to me why there's racism in America? I don't remember black people blowing themselves up on buses. It's a different conflict. And I love when Americans say, oh, it's an apartheid. Are you kidding me? If any country between Israel and the United States could even be compared, America would have a lot more comparisons. And again, I'm not trying to use, I'm not even trying to say that. Because apartheid was an extreme, extreme form of government that was brutally oppressive. Yes, Israel, we have our challenges, but we're a democracy with those challenges, which means that when an Arab suffers discrimination in Israel, unlike in South Africa, he has a legal avenue within which to fight against that discrimination because it is illegal. It wasn't in South Africa. In an apartheid system, racism is legalized. It's institutionalized. But what about the West Bank? Because that's what people are going to say to you. What about this area where you know Jews have some rights and Arabs have other rights? First of all, you're already wrong because it's not Jews and Arabs. There's no laws laid out for Jews and Arabs. There's laws laid out for Israelis and for Palestinians, which makes sense because there's two different national identities here. There's two different citizenships here. And this isn't one country, the West Bank. In fact, the West Bank isn't a country. It's not part of any country. It is a disputed territory, disputed between the Israelis and the Palestinians. And there isn't one administration who's distributing rights unequally. There's two administrations, an Israeli administration and a Palestinian administration. And why? Why, was the, why were they separated? Oh, that sounds like apartheid. Why were Palestinians put into one area and Israelis in another area? And the craziest answer, right? It's not security. It's because that's what the Palestinians demanded. God, cue the 1990s and the Oslo Accords where the Palestinians said, we want self-government. And we said, okay. And Israel handed over territory to them. And so now there's jurisdiction in the West Bank that's Palestinian. So the Palestinian Authority gives out rights. They have legal jurisdiction. So of course there are different rights because there's two different administrations. I look at people and say to chalk up what's going on in the, in the West Bank to apartheid is crazy. Don't get me wrong. It's not good. I mean, this was supposed to last five years and it's lasted 25 years. That can't be good. But the more I'm busy talking about apartheid and how irrelevant it is, the more I'm not actually talking about the real issues on the ground and how we can solve them. This is not a conflict about racism. Zionism is not racism. Zionism is the belief in and support for Jewish self-determination in their historic indigenous homeland. This is a conflict about nationalism. It's two national groups fighting for self-determination on the same land. Racism is a symptom. It's not the disease. And it makes sense that it's a symptom because when you're in conflict with somebody for over 100 years, naturally some people are going to develop racial biases. It's a sad reality. But again, calling it apartheid is demonizing. And excuse me, more, the most important thing is it's actually diminishing what happened to Black people in South Africa. That's the, that's the real problem. This word is irrelevant in this context. That's the point. Let's get to the last point because we're running out of time. The last point is the most important in my perspective because these first two reasons are interesting. Even if they were true, right? If like, let's say we did steal the land or let's say, you know, we were an apartheid. I would still look at somebody and say, with all due respect, even though those things aren't true, even if they were, how can you say that we don't have a right to exist? Like, I love when Americans come to me and they're like, you don't have a right to exist. You came and ethnically cleansed, you know, the natives and stole their land. And I'm like, homie, you're an American. Do you want to like think through that a second? I'll give you a second. Before you, yeah, maybe. And here, I'm not even trying to say the two wrongs make a right. You actually did that. We didn't. 
or apartheid, my favorite. It's like, oh, you're an apartheid. You shouldn't exist. And I'm like, hold on. Wasn't there a country under apartheid? What was it called? South. Oh, right. It's still called South Africa. It still exists. And under when it was under an apartheid regime for those four decades, people didn't chant down to with South Africa. Let's eliminate South Africa. They said, end, they said end apartheid. Because when people do things that you disagree with, you tell them to stop doing those things. You don't tell them to stop existing. This is where the criticism get, goes off the rails. And this is maybe just maybe why some Jews claim that anti-Zionism is a form of anti-Semitism. Because we're the only people who face that kind of criticism. And so again, I look at people and I say, look, I'll answer your ridiculous question about my right to exist. I wanna point out, first of all, that what you said isn't true, but second of all, I wanna point out how disgusting it is that you're making me stand here defending my right to exist. And I want you to acknowledge that you've never done that with anybody else in this world. And then I want you to ask yourself why you happen to be doing it to Jews. Live with it, figure it out. Last point. The last point's the one that you'll hear mostly from Palestinians. And it's a very simple point. Jews don't have a right to self-determination because religions don't have a right to self-determination. And Jews are a religion. So that's true, the first part. Religions don't have a right to self-determination. What I think we all know as Jews is that the second part is far from true. Jews have never been a religion. Judaism is the religion of the Jewish people, but you don't have to believe in any of that to be part of the people. Yes, do we all agree? You don't need to believe in God to be Jewish. You need to be born to a Jewish mother, Jewish father, or you can join the people through conversion. I'm the daughter of two converts. I'm all about it. But when you convert, you're not just joining a religion. You are taking on the history, the culture, the language, the land, everything that encapsulates Jewish peoplehood. It's joining a civilization. It's joining a tribe. It's not joining a religion. So we're not a religion because we don't all have to believe in the same creed and that's what makes a group a religion. Ethnicity, I also am not a fan of because we span the ethnic. You line up a bunch of Jews and you're like, how can you claim they're all from the same ethnic group? They all look differently. And so ethnically, even speaking, eh, it's too small. It's too small of a box. Race is like the most ridiculous thing. That was like a German you know, creation. So what are we? How do we talk about ourselves? Jews are a people. And we know this. We call ourselves Am Israel the nation of Israel. And I don't use the word nation because it's too mixed up with nationality and nations and states. We're a people. Anthropologically speaking, what does that mean? That we share four things. And I already mentioned them a second ago. One, we share a collective and unique history that is ours. And it doesn't matter where it happened in the world. We as Jews collectively identify it as part of our story together. So the Spanish Inquisition is part of my story whether I was there and, or my, my relatives were there or not, right? And the Farhuds, the massacre of Jews in Iraq in the 1940s is part of my story, even though I'm far from Middle Eastern in terms of my more recent roots. All of it's our story. And we acknowledge that and we have a yearly calendar that brings up the most significant parts of that collective history going back to ancient times. From the exile, from the, from the exodus from Egypt to the potential, the, 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 the attempted genocide of the Jewish people, in the Persian empire under Xerxes. So we share a history. The second thing we share is a culture, a yearly calendar, holidays, the Sabbath, the Passover Seder that every Jew everywhere in the world, if you practice it all, will sit down on the same night and follow the same order. And yeah, it might look different in your house than it is in my house. I go to Persians houses and at some point they pick up scallions and they start whipping each other, it's crazy. And in my house, like my dad's gonna chop off a hunk of horseradish at some point and make you eat it. And in somebody else's house, you might get a really nice piece of romaine lettuce. And so, yeah, there are things that are slightly different, but overall the traditions stay the same. Why? Why were they different? Because we lived in exile. So of course they were different. We ate horseradish in Europe because that's what all we were able to dig up from under the frozen ground. And in the Middle East, they had lettuce, but we kept the same calendar. We stuck to the same traditions. We kept the same language as our core language. And you know, something crazy happened. We went home. And you know, a lot of people would say to me, you know, before that, like, look, all the traditions you just spoke about were religious traditions. Religions can claim the same thing. They're right. But then we went home. And all of a sudden, we found ourselves being able to develop Jewish culture again. Echad Am's vision of this cultural center 
came to fruition. And now I can go to young Jews all over the world, from Australia to South Africa to Brazil, and say, how many of you guys have heard of Omer Adam? And every one of them raises their hand and has a smile on their face. How many of you guys voted for Neta Barzilai in the Eurovision? How many of you watch Fauda? How many of you sing the song Yerushalayim, Shel Zahav? That's Jewish culture, well beyond just religious culture. And it was able to finally thrive again when we went home. So we share a culture. The third thing we share is a language. Again, that language that so many people can look at us and say, what are you talking about, Charlie? Here you are speaking English. And I look at them and say, of course I spoke English. I lived in exile. But I prayed in one language and I learned in one language. And you know, the craziest thing happened. So here was this language. We spoke it 2000 years ago. And then, yeah, it mostly died as a spoken language because we ended up in exile. And then something crazy happened. Another cultural Zionist, Eliezer ben Yehuda, sees what's happening and he says, wait a second. We're creating a country. What language are we going to speak? It can't be German or Yiddish or Russian, God forbid. No, it has to be our language. And he sat down and he modernized Hebrew. And he put out the first modern Hebrew dictionary. He forced his kids to speak Hebrew. They had no friends. But because of his efforts, now here we are 100 years later. And there are at least 9 million people in this world speaking that language in the only place it was ever spoken before colloquially. And if that doesn't give you chills, if that doesn't make somebody realize Jewish indigeneity, I don't know what will. But that's what happens when an indigenous people returns home. The last thing that we share is that we share a home. We share one land, one land that we recognize as our indigenous homeland, a land that we never let go of, a land that throughout all of our traditions over the last 2000 years, we emphasized. When you stand up and you pray in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the evening, in every one of those prayers, we talk about returning to Jerusalem. We talk about rebuilding our city, our home. Every bit of our traditions were tied back to this idea that one day we will return home. That's the only place where we can dig our heels in and say, not that the land belongs to me. I don't like it. I don't like that. It doesn't leave room for anybody else, but that we belong to the land because we do. So let's wrap this up. Okay, maybe the person says, I cave, you are a people. You have a right to self-determination. I have two follow-up questions. One, why does it have to be a state instead of just like autonomy within a, within a country? And why does it have to be there? Let's answer the second part first, because I, I don't, I, I guess this one blows my mind. I'm very Jewish about how I answer this question. I'm gonna answer it with another question. I tend to look at people and say, where else would you like us to go? I'll wait. There's always a cheeky Jew in the audience who says, what about Uganda? Yeah, I love this one, right? Because I'm sitting here thinking to myself, okay, so here we are in the 21st century and the Jews return to their indigenous homeland and we're still being accused of being colonialists. What would have happened had we gone to Uganda? <laughs> oh, right, we would have been colonialists. At some point, all the black people around us would have been like, who are these white people? because we're not from Uganda. There is no other place. We've spent 2000 years wandering around the world. And so this is the one place that we call home. And no, it doesn't have to be at the expense of another people because again, every step of the way from 37 to 47, from 2000 to 2008, we kept accepting partition plans that would have allowed both of us to achieve self-determination on this land. And the last question, why does it have to be a state? It is everything of, that is Zionism. It's looking at somebody and going back to that history. Because for us, Zionism is survival. And they look at me like I'm crazy. Survival. What do you think is going to happen to the Jews? Well, you think some guy is just going to like wake up one day and decide to wipe all you guys out? And of course, all of us Jews are going, uh-huh, that's exactly what we think is going to happen. And the reason we think that is because 80 years ago, that is what happened. And then here's the most common misconception that we need to tackle is people thinking that there's a lot more Jews in the world than there actually are. Because when I say to somebody, six million Jews died, if they think that there were hundreds of millions of us walking around, it's not about survival. It's tragic, it's horrific, but it's not survival. So I say to them, it wasn't just six million, it was 33% of the Jewish population in the world. A third of us, 
entire families, entire histories wiped out in the span of six years. Oh, but you know, Jews are really comfortable in America today. Okay, great. Well, not all Jews can live in America. And second of all, Jews were also very comfortable in Germany in the 1920s. And God forbid am I saying that that's going to happen in America, but it could. And they don't think that it could, but you know why it can't? And this is my, my, final, my final remark. You know why it can't? Not because I have any faith in the world, unfortunately. I'm a Jew. I'm a scholar of anti-Semitism. The only reason that I know that it will never happen again is because there is a state of Israel. That's the point that we must make to people. I don't know about you all. I'm pretty sure I'm going to make a guess that every single one of us has lived in a world where we have felt a sense of security that Jews, your parents probably did not feel. And we sometimes, it wasn't 33% of European Jews. It was over 50% of European Jews. It was a 33% of the Jewish people in the world. Let's be very clear. There were 18 million Jews in the world. 6 million were killed. That is 33% of the Jewish world population. Sorry, I just had to correct that. Going back to what I was saying. <sighs> Israel is our sense of security. It's that only thing that when things go really bad, when you know Jews who are praying at a synagogue in Pittsburgh are murdered for being Jewish, it's that moment where we can all say to ourselves, well, you know, when push comes to shove, at least we know that if things get really bad, we either have somewhere to go or there is an army out there in the world that will have our back. We shouldn't be surprised, right? That anti-Semites target Israel first. Of course they do. If I wanna go after the Jews, I'm gonna first go after their first line of defense. And the first line of defense is a Jewish army. And again, the only way that people will understand that is if we come at it from a personal place and explain what it is like to live a Jewish life, to wear a Jewish star publicly, knowing that you are potentially putting yourself at risk in any moment for somebody to attack you. And yes, we as Jews in this generation and your generation have lived a privileged life as Jews for one reason. Not because they've made it better for us, but because there is a country out there to protect us. And I'm not ever going to compromise that away. I am never going to accept being relegated back to a powerless, defenseless minority in this world. And no one should be demanding that of us. Because we are not just the people who are persecuted today, we are a people who have been persecuted every step of the way for the last 3,000 years from the moment we became a people until today. And so if any minority out there in the world not just has the right, but has the need for a country with an army, it is the Jews. And so we are going to fight tooth and nail to make sure that it is, that it, that it continues to exist. And I'm not going to apologize for it because the only reason that it needs to exist is not because of us. It's because of the world. And so I look at anti-Zionists and I say to them, you know what? You don't want a Jewish state to exist. It's very simple. Let's me and you fight to defeat anti-Semitism. And the day anti-Semitism no longer exists, we won't need a Jewish country. And watch how quick, quickly they won't know how to respond because most people don't see anti-Semitism and Zionism having any correlation. And we have to draw that for them. And we have to explain to them that security that we feel, knowing that we have a place to go. That's home. Thanks everyone so much. Charlotte, thank you so much. We do have a few questions in the chat box, if I could uh, share those with you. Uh, and then we do, for everyone listening in, we have a little bit of a wrap up, so stay through um, till I guess about 12.15, it would be great. Someone asks, Anna asks, can you address the abandonment of Israel by many young American Jews, even some yeshiva students and rabbis? Yeah, um, I, I mean, I said it, right? It, it's hard sometimes to realize the privilege that we've lived with. And I'm not talking about the privilege that we're accused of, right? Oh, the Jews are rich and wealthy. That's not what I mean. I'm talking about internally. The privilege that we have as a Jewish generation that again lives in a world with the protection that we have, right? And it is sometimes very, very easy to forget that because we were born and raised with it. It's not some, we, we've never lacked that in our, in our day to day. 
maybe if you were raised by parents who never, who didn't have that in most of their lives, maybe you, you'll you know it. You know, your generation, they, they're Zionists. It, through and through, it wasn't even a question. What do you mean? Of course we need Israel. This younger generation, they don't get it because when you live a life borderline free of anti-Semitism, you don't understand the need for Israel. And then your default as a Jew naturally is going to be but there's another people here who are suffering as a result of our state. Now that's not true. That's, that's a, a very easy or very narrow way to look at the reality. But they sit there and they think to themselves, oh, well, the reason well, we're now, we've turned and look at what we're doing. Now we're now morally corrupt because of the occupation. You know, there's a sad idea that I've come to over my years of dealing with a lot of young people. And that's that I believe there's two kinds of Jews in the world when it comes to this. Jews like me who were raised, you know, having a Passover Seder every year when we say, and every generation they will rise up to destroy us and understanding that that's true because I was taught that history and really accepting the fact that no matter what I do, there are going to be anti-Semites and they can tell me, you know, stop being religious and well, we won't hate you or, you know, stop being a Zionist and we won't hate you. And I know that that's just talk. And so I, I know the fact that it's here and it's here to stay, which let's acknowledge is the shittiest thing to have to accept as a child and as any adult to say, oh yeah, people are going to hate us no matter what. That sucks. So in every generation, there are Jews who say there must be a reason that they hate us. And if we just correct that thing, we can solve anti-Semitism. And so in Germany, it was, oh, they hate our religion. Let's be Christians or let's become scientists and you know professors. And then they won't hate us anymore. And those same people who had abandoned all of their Jewish, their Jewish tradition, they were walked off to the gas chamber just like everybody else. And maybe that was the moment that it dawned on them. And in this generation, it's young people who say, oh, it's the occupation. That it's what we're doing to the Palestinians. That's why the world hates us. And if we just stop that, if we just correct ourselves, people won't hate us anymore. And it's a beautiful notion, right? This idea that there's something we can do to actually solve anti-Semitism. There's not. And yes, we should continue to criticize. We should continue to be vocally critical of Israel in our own spaces amongst other Zionists who are doing it for the right reasons because we want Israel to be the best country that we can be. We don't need to accept all of their policies, but going to the extreme of, of accepting, okay, maybe we should just have a one state and there, there doesn't need to be a Jewish state. It's abandoning your people. And they, again, they don't see it that way. They see it as Tikkun Olam, they see it as, as a way to help the Palestinians and they don't realize the harm that it will cause to their own people. And again, I think the kicker here is that there is a way to help the Palestinians and, and get them to a point where maybe they could have a legitimate government, legitimate leadership and, and in the future self-government and self-determination. And it doesn't have to come at the expense of the Jews. And they don't see that right now. And so they don't think they're abandoning us. They think they're helping us. And so we have to figure out a way where they can still feel that feeling because we should feel that feeling towards Palestinians. They shouldn't have to suffer. But at the same time, Jews also shouldn't have to suffer. So if you're for human rights, don't just be for human rights of who you perceive to be the victim or who you perceive to be the underdog. Be for human rights for everybody. And that includes Israelis who also have the right to walk down the street and get on a bus and not be afraid that it's going to get blown up like I did for much of my adolescent years. It's sad, but we can, again, it's not about pushing one aside and embracing the other. It's about how can both of these exist in the same place? And that's what I try to do with young people more than anything else is that it's not mutually exclusive. This is not a zero sum game. There is nuance here and there's a way in which we can move forward and solve this conflict where both sides will have to compromise, but both sides can achieve that independence that they so desperately deserve and need. Yeah. That's great, thank you. A couple of questions about um, Palestine uh, and the Palestinians. What is the status of water supplies for the Palestinians? The claim is that Israel is providing less than they should. Yeah, it's a, this is a complete fabrication. So back in Oslo, there was an agreement made about water and it very clearly stated that Israel would control the water resources, but would work with a body within the Palestinian Authority 
um, in, in water distribution to the Palestinians. Israel committed to giving a certain amount of water per capita to the Palestinians. We've actually always exceeded that number, sometimes by four times what we we promised based on greater usage of water in the 21st century just by more higher economic countries and so this is a complete fabrication however when people say you know well israel's in control it it wasn't something that we just said we're taking control this was agreed upon by both the israelis and the palestinians that there would be a water board that would work together in the distribution of water unfortunately the palestinian authority started to uh, boycott that about 10 years ago, it, it's become much harder to coordinate the distribution of water. However, water continues to flow into the Palestinian areas um, and is distributed by the Palestinian Authority, and they are not lacking water. And the last thing I'll say is they tend to say, well, settlers get this amount of water and Palestinians get this amount of water. Settlers, Israeli settlements are hooked up to the Israeli water grid. And so it's not that they're receiving more water. They turn on their faucet and they get water and then they pay for their usage, which is not how it works in the Palestinian areas. So it's not like they're thinking, oh, let's give X amount to the settlers and X amount to Palestinians. Settlers use water like anybody else uses water and then they pay again for their usage. So that's just, again, there's such wild fabrications around this notion. Um, and, and again, if the Palestinian Authority was cooperating and you know would continue to meet with the coordinator of government activities in the territories, who's responsible for the distribution of water, things would probably be a lot better in terms of how, how they are distributed. But again, there's no lack of water um, when it comes to the Palestinians. They just have to minimize their usage because of the way in which it's being distributed. And the fact that most of them are not hooked up to a proper water grid, and that goes back to improper development of the infrastructure by the Palestinian Authority over the last 25 years since it's been under their control. And I'll just ask one more because of time. Uh, Alan asks, certain PA areas, pal certain Palestinian Authority areas are off limits to Israel, the Israelis. Can you comment on that? Yeah, so Area A, which is the area that Israel completely withdrew from during the Oslo Accords in 94, 95, 96, uh, which became under full Palestinian Authority control. Um, after unfortunate incidences of Israelis entering those territories and being lynched or kidnapped, uh, Israel passed a law saying that Israelis were, it, that it was illegal for Israelis to enter those territories, mainly again because they didn't want the responsibility of having to go in after Israelis if something happened to them. Now, there is an unwritten um, understanding that Israeli Arabs travel into Area A pretty consistently, and no one, the Israelis aren't going to stop them, the Palestinians aren't going to stop them. Um, and there's also Israelis who go into Area A. I've gone into Area A, but usually if you want to do it properly, you would sign a document um, and, and give it to the Israeli military stating that you're basically signing your life away. That if anything happens, you don't have to come in after me, I am taking this risk. Uh, but this was done for security reasons. It's not a Palestinian law, so we need to be careful with that, right? They didn't decide this. It was the Israelis who decided it, but it was a result of, of the, the sad fact that Israeli Jews um, found themselves not safe in those areas, and that's why it had to, that, that this law had to be passed. Yeah. Thank you so much. Your enthusiasm is amazing and your knowledge equally so. Thank you. And I'm going to hand it now over to Naomi Marinsky. Before you do, can I just, I just want to say thank you uh, to all of you for taking this time on your Sunday morning to listen, to learn. And again, I, you know, I always tend to say to people, it's not just about us knowing. And a lot of people say like, what can I do? I'm only one person, but you're not one person. Look around this room. We are a team and there's so many more people out there. There's so many students who I work with day in, day out. We're all part of the same team. And if all of us make just a little effort, it's not just a drop in the bucket, but it becomes a tidal wave of information that we can spread. And so don't ever be discouraged. Take it one person at a time. And when somebody's not willing to listen, just move on. Haters gonna hate, as we say and they're not worth your time, but there are a lot of people out there who just don't know. And if you spark the conversation and spark that curiosity, you can really change the way people perceive Israel and the way that they perceive Jews and really turn them into people who understand Zionism. So don't ever be discouraged and just know that Stand With Us is always, always here for you every step of the way to help with those efforts. So thank you guys so much for being here and just for listening. Thank you, Charlotte. Uh, you really are amazing. You really took a very, very complex topic and made it at least approachable. 
I'd like to take a part of that in my Hadassah moment and talk a little bit about BDS, the boycott, divestment, and sanction movement affecting Israel. We're all aware of the recent controversies in the news about Ben and & Jerry and their parent company Unilever's decision not to sell ice cream in the West Bank, also known as Judea and Samaria. Hadassah has recently asserted the following platform. Hadassah reaffirms its long-standing policy against all forms of organized boycotts and denounces the systematic global campaign to delegitimize the state of Israel. <clears throat> During the past few years, the United States has seen a dramatic rise in BDS campaigns. What is BDS? The boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement known as BDS began in 2005. That's when many Palestinian organizations called for an economic, cultural, and academic boycott of Israel for its alleged violations of Palestinian rights and its occupation of the West Bank and Gaza. Inspired by the success of the global movement to end apartheid in South Africa, the BDS campaign seeks to enlist academics, countries, and companies to punish and isolate Israel. Its biggest gains so far have been in convincing numerous college student groups and a growing number of celebrities like Ben & Jerry to support its boycott. After the latest round of tensions between Israel and Hamas in May, Ben & Jerry's announced its, its decision to stop selling its product in the occupied Palestinian territory. The two founders have long been engaged in social issues and the decision followed months of pressure by pro-Palestinian activists. Unilever announced that Ben & Jerry's is not boycotting Israel because it plans to keep selling its product within Israel's 1967 borders. Ben & Jerry stated that if it is, it is not consistent with our values for our ice cream to be sold in the occupied Palestinian territory. However, in light of the Israeli law that bans boycotts of the West Bank, it will not be possible to stop selling products only in certain parts of Israel and not in others. Ben and Jerry's decision to stop selling its ice cream in the West Bank prompted calls across the US to boycott Ben and Jerry's and its parent company, Unilever. Thus, boycotting the boycotters. 35 states have passed anti-BDS laws, executive orders, and resolutions. When asked how it felt to be wrapped up in anti-Semitism, both Ben and Jerry denied the label due to the fact that they are Jewish. They said that they understand how people might be upset and that it's a very emotional and painful issue. What do you think? Are Ben and Jerry anti-Semitic? Are they anti-Zionist? What will you do? I'd like to toss to my colleague, Isabel Ballatin, who will expound on what we, Hadassah and Stand With Us members can do to make a difference. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you, Helen and Goldie. And thank you all for joining us this morning for this very important program. Stand With Us and Hadassah have part partnered with the Southeast region since its inception seven years ago. We look forward to more joint programs together. I'm Isabel Ballatin. Alan Siegel and I are the community coordinators of the newly formed Northeast Florida Stand With Us chapter of the Southeast region. Shout out to Melissa Berenson, our associate director of the region, who is here with us tonight. We appreciate all your guidance. By coming here today, you've shown your interest in this topic, which is so close to our hearts. Stand With Us is here for you today and every day. Boots on the ground in Northeast Florida, as well as Hadassah, to be your go-to organizations for if you experience anti-Semitism in your schools, in your workplace, and in your neighborhoods. We have a resource of printed materials. I know you're seeing this backwards, but I have loads of material in my garage if anybody would like to come and pick them up so you have something to use to give you information, please feel free to come. We have programs in our middle schools. We have interns in our schools. We have 200 pro bono lawyers throughout the world 
to who can help us if we experience an anti-Semitic incident. So contact Alan or me or Hadassah anytime. My email will be in the chat box. So you know the facts. You came here today. You've learned about Israel, Zionism, and the Jewish people. So go forth and share. Am Yisrael Chai. Thank you all for attending. Shalom. I couldn't have said it better myself, Isabel. It's been Hadassah's pleasure to work with you and partner with you um, to bring this program. And please know that this is the beginning of a longstanding theme going forward in programming for Hadassah and obviously stand with us as we move through the rest of the year. Enjoy your day. Thank you for spending part of it with us. Please stay well and we'll see you very soon.